give the Lord praise, would you? Amen. Thank you for being here tonight at the harbor. We love and appreciate you. What an awesome time we had on Sunday morning. And uh, I have heard counts as low as 430 and as high as 466. So as a pastor, I tend to believe the larger number. But nonetheless, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, irregardless, uh, we may never know the exact, but uh, there was a drove of folks here. In fact, the parking lot team told me we didn't have no more spots. And so um, that's exciting. Next year, we will definitely do two services at Easter if we don't have to do it before then, to be honest with you. And so um, I'm excited about it. And we opened a brand new series entitled Jesus, a.k.a. How many of you have seen the billboards? Some of you, well, most of you have. Praise the Lord. How many of you heard the radio ad on K-Bay? I know y'all listen to the country music. And <laughs> anyway, uh, so thank you so much for listening. Thank you for watching and seeing those billboards. And we tried that just to see what happens, you know. And so we've already sent mail. The best I can tell from all the cards that came in, we had 27 visiting families with us on Sunday. <clears throat> That's not, not individuals, but families. We've already written, uh, I know the follow-up team, Pastor Aaron and his group have already uh, begun to work that. Um, I've already mailed, as of today, a card to all of them as well. And uh, we've got some awesome responses um, and a negative response. But uh, <laughs> that's just part of it. You can't please everybody. Y'all with me? Say amen. But anyway, it doesn't change who we are. God is just doing some great things. And, um, but let me tell you, I'm excited. And we have that Easter series or the Easter service. It's on DVD. Uh, Brother Frank has made uh, five or six, ten copies or so right now. I always mail my mom and dad and Kelly's mom DVDs of the entire month. Um, every month I send it to them. They get a blessing out of it. As well as our shut-ins, those who cannot make it to the church, if we know of them, we mail them a copy of it, uh, no cost to them. So if you're interested in that, if you'll see Brother Frank, um, he'll be glad to hook you up. And um, anyway, if you want to make some donation, uh, that's really not required, but if you want to make something... Uh, toward the missions trip or to the church fund, building fund, then so be it. I do join uh, in Brother Ken in saying thank you so very much. I also want to remind you, how many of you believe the Word of God, every bit of it, from cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation? And um, <clears throat> the Bible says, Give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. One month ago, I stood here in the pulpit, on this day, is today the 22nd or 23rd? 23rd. So it's one month ago today, Frankie Tyson stood here, and I pledge to you that, I, in fact, I made the commitment in my heart a few weeks before that, that we would raise $10,000 and that we would build Pastor Bautista's house in Guatemala. <clears throat> and I remember telling you, I said, listen, God's going to make a way somehow, and God will bless us. And did you know what? Two weeks later, we set an all-time tithe record of over $38,000 for the month of March. Two weeks after we made the commitment to do it. 30 days after having made the commitment to raise $10,000 by October, we've raised it all but less than $800 for the building of that house. And so it puts us in a position now to say, we'll continue on with the softball tournament and uh, the other ideas that we had to raise some money and then we'll try to offset the airfare and so forth because I expect it to cost about eleven or twelve hundred dollars a person and we're going to take twelve people um, myself and Kelly and ten more and uh, I'm believing God for that we'll have a meeting very soon about it um, so be in prayer and um, I'm excited about what God's going to do Jesus aka also known as and on last Sunday, we talked our very first message in this, preached our very first message in the series, Jesus, a.k.a., and we learned that Jesus, also known as the... All right, hallelujah. The way, the truth, and the life. And I said to you that there's been a lot of men that come across the scenery of the earth 
that have proclaimed to be the way. I mentioned Joseph Stalin to you. I mentioned Adolf Hitler to you, Benito Mussolini, uh, Jim Jones, and various others who proclaim to be the enlightened one, so to speak, or to be um, the way. And I shared with you further that their sect, their group, their cults have come and gone. Are you with me? And, uh, but nonetheless, they were not the way. I shared with you that Jesus is the way up, he's the way down, he's the way in, he's the way out, and he's the way through. Through our circumstances. Um, and uh, then I shared with you that he's the truth. He's the truth about life. He's the truth about death. He's the truth about uh, you. Truth about myself. He's the truth that confronts us. His word is truth. It's forever settled in heaven. It, it helps us when we get out of line. His word is truth and used for reproof and rebuke and correction and instruction that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. His word is truth. His word is truth sometimes that we don't like to hear. His word is truth sometimes that we don't like because it goes against the grain of what we've told ourselves is okay. I felt that one sort of bounced back. But his word is truth when the world is lying. His word is truth when leaders are lying. His word is truth when churches are lying. His word is forever settled in heaven. So he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. I share with you that he is our physical life. It is the breath of God, the ruach of God, the Hebrew word. When God breathed into Adam's nostrils and he became a living soul, it is the spirit that makes the body alive. And when God whoo, breathed into Adam's nostrils, man become a living soul. That's, it comes from the same word inspired. It goes back to that Hebrew word ruach. The, the word of God is whoo, breathed by God. What does it take me to do? If you were close enough, you might not like it, but you could feel the breath coming from my body as I breathe these words to you right now. And God breathed into life, to us life, and man became a soul that will live eternally somewhere. And so he's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. Um, the life, he's the physical life, and we have this physical life. He's the giver of life. Don't you know that? When the sperm meets the egg and life begins and a billion cells start into motion, it is because God gives life. Amen. So he's... He's the giver of life. Not only is he a giver of physical life, he's the giver of spiritual life. When a man's 40 years old and yet lost, the Bible says if that man will believe in his heart and confess with his mouth that God raised his son Jesus from the dead, huh? he said, thou shalt be saved. And a 40-year-old man becomes born again, a brand new baby in Jesus Christ. So God is the giver of physical life. He's the giver of spiritual life. And last but not least, I told you that God was the giver of eternal life. He's the only one that can make it last forever. Amen? That he can give eternal life. So, now, I, I'm, I've spent the day today, and by the way, I've had a wonderful uh, couple days, three days or so with my sister, and she left this morning at 11 o'clock, and uh, uh, I took Monday off and spent some time with her although I recruited her to come to the office with us on Tuesday and work here. <laughs> so uh, we just had to get some things done and uh, some correspondence, and so God has blessed us, and I, I'm so thankful for that. In the I was looking ahead at what I would preach this coming Sunday, and whoo, child, you don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss it. I'm going to talk about Jesus, a.k.a. our healer. And it may sound a little bit boring. It may sound so simple and so easy. I promise you will leave here as you came. Jesus, our healer. We're going to talk about that Sunday. A week from then, if we have a we can in glory, we'll talk about Jesus, a.k.a. our Savior, our Redeemer, that we'll put those together. But it's going to, I'm blown away at what God's going to do in the next few weeks. And then... Um, I think it is Mother's Day Sunday, and I haven't built this message completely, but the idea is so swirling in my head. <laughs> uh, I, I just—I better not tell you. I know what I'm going to do. 
I'm excited about it, but I just got to tell you to get your mom ready and get her here. It's not going to be just for mothers, but for all of us. But I'm going to close this series with a very strong and powerful message, and uh, God's really going to touch us. But tonight I want to talk with you about Jesus, the burden bearer. He's also known, there's so many, I, you know, if you were to go and Google, and Google, it seems like, is the universal, uh, you know, go-to guy. It's, uh, you know, that's what we do. We Google things before we even ask Jesus sometimes, if we're not careful. But if you were to Google the names of God, it'd blow your mind. Then you'd have to get another dictionary, the Hebrew dictionary and the Greek dictionary, uh, to find out what they said. <laughs> Are you with me? Say Amen. And then you'd have to get a little deeper and find out the context in which it was said. So, but nonetheless, if you were to Google the names of God, you'd come up with easily, easily, 100, 150 names, easily. We could talk about Jehovah Jireh, uh, he is my provider. We could talk about Jehovah Shalom, he is my peace. We could talk about uh, just all, uh, Jehovah our righteousness, Jehovah Sidkenu. We could talk about Jehovah Rapha. We could go on and on and on of the names of God. And um, I better not get wound out doing that because I need to talk with you about the burden bearer. But tonight, we know him as the burden bearer. Now, there's a place in Scripture, and forgive me, I didn't put the text up there for you, but uh, uh, there's a place there where he says, Cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. There's another place in Luke where he says, uh, for us to bring our burdens to the Lord. To, he said, because, he says, uh, if we bring him our burdens, he can help us because his yoke is easy. And, uh, He's the burden bearer. Now, years ago, I preached a series about the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you're not familiar, the four, first four books of the New Testament are what we call Gospels, uh, good news. The first three are synoptic. Uh, that means they are, they're almost synonymous. They, um, they, they seem to retrace. In fact, they really all seem to in somewhat, although John is a little different. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Mark was the first writer. Although he's in second in position, he wrote first. It's called Mark and Priority, but nonetheless, it's neither here nor there for you tonight. But Mark displayed Jesus or portrayed him uh, in, in a way that he was, we know him as what? The Lion of the tribe of Judah. And Mark portrayed him as this bounding, ferocious, fierce lion that was coming onto the scene and he was here and he was there and, and so on and so forth. And then, then Matthew writing next actually, Matthew portrayed him as the teacher of Israel, a human face. And, and you know, it, it amazes me, how many of you know that the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament is a great parallel? It all comes together. You remember Ezekiel saw a vision of God one time? He saw a vision and he said, I saw, as it were, uh, the face of a lion. He said, I saw the face of a man, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. Four sides, if you will. The, the, the lion, the ox, the eagle, and the man. Isn't it amazing that the New Testament writers, Mark portrayed him as a lion, a bounding lion. Luke portrayed him as a burden-bearing ox. John portrayed him as a high-flying eagle. And Matthew portrayed him as the teacher of Israel. There it is again. And, and not only did, did um, Ezekiel see it this way, Nebuchadnezzar in a dream as well. So we see things that's woven all through the fabric of Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament alike. And um, it's all tied together. So, but, but the burden-bearing ox. Having said what I said about the others, I, since tonight I want to deal with how he's known as a burden-bearer. Someone wrote a song years ago. It said, take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. And, uh, and that's what you can do. That's what we are to do. And why? Because he's the burden bearer. 
He's the one. And let me just take you back in Scripture, if I may, and I want to give you just a few facts, I guess, about, about an ox from old time. Now, today, we still use oxen. Are you with me? We still use them in certain parts of the world, without a doubt, even in this country. But without machinery and the modern age that we have and the technology we have available, the ox was the ancient world's most powerful machine. He was the symbol of divine strength in the known world of Luke's day. Even the Pentateuch, that's the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, likens God to the horns of a wild ox. And um, so, so the ox, being the burden bearer, uh, represented the strength of machinery today. We couldn't operate in this country hardly anymore without machinery. Every one of you here uh, drove in an automobile, most likely. I didn't see any bicycles out there or skateboards, but even those would quite possibly qualify uh, in, in, as some type of machine. Great leaders in the Bible were referred to uh, as an ox as well. In fact, in Deuteronomy, the final blessing of Moses on the 12 tribes of Israel, he calls Joseph's son a firstborn bull. The ox was the universal bearer of burdens. When you think about an ox, I'll bet you, you think about an ox that is, that is harnessed uh, to a plow. Or you think about one that is harnessed to a wagon. Or he's harnessed to something that he's pulling. He's using his strength to get it done. The ox was that universal bearer, pulling the carts, the heavy loads, plowing, treading the grain. Clearly, throughout ancient history, the ox did everything. It would be like the engine for us today. The writer of Proverbs said so much that where there is no oxen, there is no grain. Because the abundant crops came by the strength of the ox. The ox was the symbol also of wealth. And it was important enough to be included in the Tenth Commandment when he said, You shall not covet your neighbor's ox. They knew that the ox was a symbol of strength. It would, like, it would be like in the modern day owning a tractor or a combine, if you will. Oxen were not the only bearer of literal burdens or physical burdens of men, but they also bore the spiritual burden of sin. How many of you know that many, many, many oxen have died as a sacrifice on an altar somewhere to expunge, if you will, or to cover the sins of mankind? It was the blood of an ox, the blood of a bull, that would um, atone for, if you will, the sins in, in the old law uh, or under the Mosaic law. And all of that was a type and a shadow pointing to one day when the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, they call him, a.k.a. the supreme sacrifice, the propitiation of our sin, the substitute. You and I should have been there, but he took our place. Amen. The burden-bearing ox. And so, so many, many, many oxen have been slain to be laid on an, or laid on an altar and slain for the covering of sins. And um, the minister, the priest, would lay his hand on the head of the ox symbolically, transferring the sins of man to the animal. And then the animal would be slaughtered as a sacrifice for the sin of man, foreshadowing Jesus um, if you are a student of the Word of God, you'll find when Solomon sacrificed or when he dedicated the temple that was built, when Solomon dedicated his temple, he slaughtered 22,000 oxen and worshiped the Lord. So I know what some people would say. What a waste. What a wa 22,000 oxen. That's a lot. Are y'all with me? But, oh, if you could have seen the glory of the Lord that came into that place, if you could have heard the voice of God, if you could have seen the pillars shake, if you could have heard what God said, oh, they wrote it down. Are you with me? Say amen. Anyway, so we see not only the ox as the ancient machine, we see the ox as that burden bearer. We find the ox in the temple 
as a sacrifice, if you will. We find him there, but we find him also in the stall. Concerning the birth of Christ, Matthew sees through the eyes of Joseph. He sees kings and he sees wise men and powerful people. Luke sees through the eyes of Mary. The opening chapter is not about genealogy like it is in Matthew, but it's more about her family. The angels appears not in a dream um, to Joseph as, as was in Matthew's account, but he comes physically and visibly uh, to Mary, to her kinsmen, and to the shepherds. Um, Luke, very educated himself, the most educated of all the writers of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, or Luke, and John. And he draws a portrait showing Jesus came and that while Luke was the most educated of all, the most affluent of all, and quite possibly made the best living in that day, it took him two volumes to write his account. He wrote Luke and Acts. But he says, although he is an educated man and probably does fairly well for himself in that day and in that world setting, that social context, he says that Jesus came to the poor. He says that um, he came to the lowly of this world. When Jesus is finally born, he is born in an, guess what, ox's stall and laid in the bed of an ox. It's feeding trough, if you will, a, a manger. So an ox may look gentle to you. They may look slow. They may seem stubborn, but don't be fooled. He's full of strength and speed. More importantly, the ox is full of determination to get it done. Um, the ox is found in the temple for sacrifice, so to the poor, they're welcome there with God. Jesus is taken to the temple when he's only eight days old. He's only eight days old, and according to the Mosaic law, he had to be circumcised on the eighth day and officially named. The Word of God tells us that his name had already been given. We understand all of that. But he came on the eighth day uh, for his mother's purification and for his circumcision and the naming. Mary and Joseph don't have the money to bring an ox, so they bring two young pigeons. That was the prescribed way because they didn't have the money for an ox or a lamb. Luke says the ox knows its owner. What's this? Jesus must be born in his father's house for he loved the temple. So here we find the baby Jesus, the ox, the burden bearer, the universal bearer of heavy loads. <laughs> uh, we find him in the temple. We find him there being uh, circumcised. By the way, that was the first blood that he shed for you. And we find his mom there for her purification from having the baby. And that was a ceremonial thing. And the naming of the baby as well on the eighth day. He's called Savior. It's the ox, the burden bearer of the lowly and the poor. Uh, it included the women. It included the Gentiles. The child is called Jesus but he's Savior, not just for one person, but for all people. Not just for one man, but for mankind. He's the universal Savior of the world. He came to seek, Luke says. Luke is obsessed with how this burden bearer came looking for something. You know what he came looking for? You know what you look for? You look for things that's lost. Are you hearing me? I don't look for my truck keys if I know where they are. I don't look for my wallet if I know where it's at, but Jesus came looking. This burden bearer came looking for burdens to bear. Amen. And uh, believe me, the world has got plenty. Uh, his birth is located in the history or the events of history. You know it. Although the shepherds are told of the Savior's birth in the city of David, the heavenly choir sings peace and God's favor to all men on earth. The Emperor Augustus, watch this, was called Savior of the world. Did you know that? That's, that's what they called the Emperor Augustus um, on monuments and was renowned for the closing the doors of the temple of war at Rome. But the true Savior and the, bringer, the one who brought peace and bore burdens was, according to Luke, found in an ox's shed, an ox's stable, behind, if you will, the providential backwaters of Bethlehem there um, in Jerusalem, that, that Jesus would be born 
right there. That, and he would not come the way, the universal bearer of burdens wouldn't come like you would think he would come. Some say, well, good Lord, he's a king. He should have come in a kingly manner. He should have come in a kingly fashion. And see, people portray, and some of you might say, well, wait a minute. Now, how did, how did Luke see him this way? And how, let me say this. If all of the, how many of y'all were here on Easter Sunday? Let me see him. You were here on Easter Sunday. If I was to get each one of you to write a half page about how you saw the message and how I preached it Sunday, I'll guarantee you Earl's edition would be different than Kim's and it would be different than Brian's and Ray's and Eddie's because we would see through the lens of Earl Hewlett. We would see through the lens of, of uh, whoever, Kim or, or Brian or Mark. We would see through someone else's eyes the way they saw it. I can read the responses from the first impressions where people gave. Most people are overwhelmed. They're just overjoyed. They're ecstatic. Man, this is the greatest church since sliced bread came along. Huh? And then there's, you know... Amen. Whoo, hallelujah. Devil is a liar. Hey, man, now if I get my mind right again, okay, I'm back. But uh, <laughs> you would see things differently. You would just, you would, uh, you would see through the lens of someone else, just like Matthew saw him as the teacher of Israel. Mark saw him as the, the pouncing, bounding lion of the tribe of Judah here and there. Luke saw him as a burden-bearing, slow, plodding, determined ox that would carry the load of mankind to Calvary. And beyond, he would trudge on to the tomb. He would go on to a place called paradise. He would be resurrected on the third day. Uh, the ox would trudge his way on out to Bethany. He would raise his hands and pray and ask God to give him the power to ascend back to heaven. Gravity would turn loose of him. The angels would say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into the heavens? For this same Jesus you've seen like, go in like manner shall come again. They would see this universal burden bearer as he's ascending back to the Father. And they would call to mind the scriptures that the burden bearer told them. You remember, I preached it on Sunday. Jesus said to them, you remember, he had told them in John chapter 11 about Lazarus dying. He told them about raising him from the dead. He told them about not only did they want to kill Jesus now because he raised Lazarus from the dead, they wanted to kill Lazarus because the Jews believed that the spirit stayed in the body for three days and then it left. And Lazarus had been dead four days and Jesus raised him from the dead. That really made him Lord. Are you with me? Say amen. At least in their eyes, they said, what in the world? But in chapter 12, he washed their feet, and then he told them it's expedient that he goes away. Um, he, he done all these things. He gave them a new commandment and said, keep this commandment uh, that you love your neighbor as yourself. And, and he began to prepare them for his departure and trying to prepare them. They just couldn't buy the fact that he was going away. But he said to them in John 14, let not your heart be troubled. He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house there's many mansions. If this were not true, I'd have told you. And I'm going to go away and prepare you a place. And if I go away and prepare you a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You know, and, and then he says to Thomas, you know the way that I'm going. Because Thomas asked him this question, how are we going to go? Or how, You know, we don't know which way you're going. And he said, yeah, you do. You know the way I'm going and the way you know. And then he goes on and adds verse 6 to it and says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And then he added that qualifier, you know, at the end of that, when he said, no man comes to the Father except through me. Amen. So here's this universal burden bearer of all the burdens in the world, of all the heartache, of all the heartbreak, of all the homesickness, of all the sadness, of all, all everything that weighs us down. Here's the burden bearer that says, I'm here, and that's why I came, to seek and save those who were lost, to bear the burdens of those who can't bear them anymore. Wow, we're going to have a good time Sunday. I believe it was probably Simeon, the first one to recognize who he was, because he come to be dedicated there. 
his mother was there and his father was there and the ceremonial cleansing for mom and the, the circumcision for baby Jesus and then the naming of him. And Simeon took him up in his arms and let me just read to you what he said. He said, Lord, now you can let your servant depart in peace according to your word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel. For a sign which will be spoken against, and yea, even a sword will pass through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. This universal bearer of burdens, there he is in the temple. Simeon recognizes him and says, Lord, now I can die in peace. I have held the long-awaited Messiah. I have held the light that will lighten the way for the Gentiles. I've held the burden bearer in my arms. So now let me show you his journey, if I may. Unlike Mark's lion, he's rushing here and there. The ox just sort of moves deliberately toward his goal, you know, uh, just trudging along, long and steady, sure, no mistaking where he's headed. He's headed to Jerusalem. 33 times, 33 times, Luke mentions the city of Jerusalem. Uh, and as often as other three Gospels combine together, um, and he's headed there for a reason. The ox is headed there with the burdens of the world upon his shoulder. That he might be the sacrificial ox. That while everything is upon him, he would die for you and I. Him, he rather, who knew no sin, would become sin for you and I. That's what it meant when the, when the priest would lay his hand on the man. And then lay his hand on the head of the ox. And basically saying the sins of this man is laid upon this ox. These heavy weights are put on this animal. So it was for all of us. Peter Marshall years ago preached a message entitled, Were You There? He demonstrated the graphic, gory execution. And he asked the question, Were You There? And then he answered the question, When they took the sin of man and put it on the burden bearer, the one that would be slain, the one that would become sin. And then he admitted, he said, I was there. You were there. And you were there. And he took all of our sins and all of our burdens and all of our grief and all of our anguish and everything was laid upon him. For we're not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold. For the blood of bulls and goats were no longer good enough. But we are redeemed with the precious blood of a spotless lamb. John said, the revelator, John the revelator said, the lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. So let me try to move on as we study tonight. Um, so I think it's significant that, that Jesus, the bearer of all burdens, even though he took upon him the weight of the world, you'd think there'd be so much weight, he could never get up. But on the third day, he did. On the third day, he did. Acts records that it was in the city of Jerusalem where this burden-bearing man had uh, give his life for us. Something happened out of that. By a man named Peter that had denied him three times in the same night, had watched him be executed, but Jesus came to him after he was raised from the dead. Peter had gone back to the Sea of Galilee and was gone fishing. And for the second time in his life, he met Jesus. He looked over to the shore one day and he saw him. And Jesus had baked fish, had them on coals, and he invited, Have you any meat, they say? 
And Jesus invites him to come. And for the second time, he hears the words, follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Now, I'll tell you what had happened. Peter had backslidden. Peter had gone back. He had quit the Lord. He had quit the ministry. He had gone back fishing. That's what he knew how to do. In that time frame of the night that he betrayed the Lord, he died the next day. And then, of course, the, um, uh, he was three nights in the tomb. He was actually in paradise. His body was in the tomb. Boy, that's a great message there. I'm going to have to preach it sometime, this great doctrine of paradise. But nonetheless, he comes forth. And, uh, but in the meantime, Peter made that statement that I'm, I'm going back to what I know. I'm going back fishing. And, I, I, you know, there's a lot of folks have done the same thing. They served the Lord for a good while, and then they decided, you know what, I'm going back fishing. Well, the Lord reached out to him, and he, um, Peter gave his heart to the Lord again. He's a God of second chances, isn't he? He gives his heart to the Lord again. And um, they went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked Simon Peter, he said, who do men say that I am? He said, well, some people say you're Isaiah. Some people say you're John the Baptist. Some people say you're one of the prophets. And Jesus looked at him with all sternness, and he said, but who do you say I am? In other words, I don't care who Larry thinks you are. I don't care who Kenny thinks you are or who Aaron thinks you are. I want to know who you think I am. Simon Peter looked at him and said, you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. He said, Simon Bar-Jonah, that means Simon Peter, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but my father which is in heaven. He said, my father has revealed this to you. And the Bible says he given the keys to the kingdom of God. He said, you know, I, I'm going to give you power. I'm going to give you the, the keys to the kingdom of God. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. And then he began to prophesy to him about how he would die. He said, Simon, you know, he asked him a question. Here it is on the sea that day. He says, do you love me more than these? He said, what do you mean? He said, you love me more than these. Do you love me more than fishing? Do you love me more than your old job? He said, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He asked him again, Simon, do you love me more than this? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. And he says, Simon, do you really love me more than all this? And this time he got aggravated. And he said, Lord, thou knowest all things. You know I love you. Now some scholars say that he asked him three times if he loved him because previously Peter had denied him three times. I don't know if that's the reason, but it's, it, it makes sense. And anyway, he says to him, he wants to go ahead and tell him something. He says, right, right now, you, you put on your clothes and you gather yourself up and go where you want to go. He said, there'll come a day where they'll bind you and take you where you do not want to go. And he said that prophesying by which way he would die and glorify the Lord. Some of you might remember, I don't know if you do or not, but Peter, when they were crucified or they were going to kill him, they would execute him by crucifixion. And he begged the executioners not to crucify him the way they did the Lord. He said, I'm not worthy to die the way the Lord died. And so they turned him upside down and crucified him head down. Um, just a powerful. But see, something happened in Jerusalem there. Before Peter died, you know, the Lord went on back to glory. Peter was commissioned to be the great pastor of the New Testament church. In fact, the Catholics today uh, believe in apostolic succession. They believe Peter to be the first pope, if you will, and um, uh, to lead the church. And, and um, anyway, <coughs> the burden bearer had said Peter would be the great preacher on that day of Pentecost. And right there in Jerusalem, guess how many people got saved? 3,000 people gave their heart to the Lord that day. Ah, it's amazing how it happened because how many of you know the Lord is a planner? God plans things. He does. He orders things. Now, I know this goes against the grain of those of you who like to fly by the seat of your pants and sort of just... But the Lord planned it where Peter would preach this message on the day of Pentecost. Penta means 50. 
And Pentecost happened 50 days after Passover. Passover was where Jesus ate the Last Supper and then would be arrested and then would be tried in a mock trial and then would be crucified. 50 days later was Passover. It was one of the three festivals that happened in Jerusalem each year that every male Jew 20 years old and up by law had to attend. Period. It was just like you paying your taxes on your house or your vehicle. By law, you're going to pay it on your birthday or you're going to pay a penalty or you're going to pay a fine and then a penalty. That's just how it is. But by law, every male Jew had to come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. It is no accident that the Lord had told, the, he told 500 people this, but only 120 showed up in the upper room. So I don't feel so bad. Sometimes he had church attendance problems too. But he told 500 people to tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you're in with power from on high. 120 of them met in the upper room, and they prayed, and they sought God. And that is where they were at when they heard the sound of a rushing mighty wind. It filled the room. Cloven tongues of fire sat upon them. They began to speak with other tongues. And the Bible said that there was people there from every nation. You know why? Oh, they had to by law come. But the Bible says there was Medes and Elamites and Parthians and uh, people from Crete and Cyrene and Phrygia and Pamphylia and uh, parts of Asia Minor and people from all over. And they said, these are all Galileans. These are, the, these are Jews. And yet we hear them speak the wondrous works of God in our native tongue. How could that be? It was God. And God is a planner. And God planned it that way. And Luke recorded it for us, by the way. Wow. So anyway, let me try to tie this up. So um, God designed it that way. Let me show you the ministry of this ox. The Bible says, um, uh, well, you know the ox being the supreme sacrifice. I guess that's the greatest picture right there is the ox was the sacrifice for you and I. He was the burden bearer for you and I. So, but let me say it like this. In Luke chapter 4, he's going to quote the words of Isaiah the prophet. And he says this in 4 and 18 through 21, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are bruised. Um, so we see the, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So we see this, uh, the, the writings of of uh, Luke, who's talking about this great burden bearer, and they start. He said, "The burden bearer said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to do these things.' And so, if I can tie it up by saying, he came to the and he came to the poor. He come to the have and he come to the have nots. He showed himself Lord to to those who were wealthy and wise, as well as those who were poor and needy and nothing, so to speak. He came to the lost. He came to the unacceptable. He says to us that there's more joy in heaven over one that comes home, one that was lost that comes home. He said there's more joy in heaven over one sinner that comes home than 99 people that's already righteous and right with God. So you say, why is it a big deal, Pastor, that we know who was here on Sunday and we know who got saved or gave their heart to the Lord? It is a big deal because it's a big deal to Him. Amen? It is a big deal to Him. So uh, you say, Pastor, why, why don't we change? I mean, there was a point in our life where, you know, we just sort of raise our hand and we come on down here. And you know, I'd love to do that. But if you put 500 people in here, you can't put them all here. Now, there's times we're going to do it anyway. We'll give it a shot anyway. The Lord says, do it. We'll bring them up here. But uh, we have to know, and I'm going through that right now. Who said on Sunday, I'm a believer today. I prayed that prayer of faith with the pastor that day so that we can follow up. So that, because heaven rejoiced over one that got saved, and you and I ought to as well. Let me say this, and I'll close. The ox is that universal carrier of heavy loads. Luke portrays him as concerned about everybody who carries a heavy load with no one to share the weight, with no one to help the poor, the outcast, the downtrodden, the meek, the lowly, the women, the Gentiles. Jesus, the burden-bearing ox, come to help 
with that. And um, he is, the Bible tells me that, um, that we who have been comforted, we ought to be able to comfort somebody else with the same comfort wherewith we have been comforted. Are you hearing me? That's why when the Wootens lost their son, I, I, the first person come to my mind was Earl and Marlene because they know what it was like to lose a son. It's one thing for me to embrace them and hug them and say, I'm here for you, I'm praying for you, when I can't really, in the greatest degree, understand it like somebody who can hug him and say, son, I know what you're feeling. I've been there. I have felt it. I've laid awake and cried. I've questioned God. I've questioned myself, and I've done this a million times. Somebody's able to comfort with the same kind of comfort they've been comforted. But Jesus is the burden-bearing ox, and... Uh, which I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And I was, it was brought to my attention just a moment ago that a precious lady I've known for years, Sister um, Crawford mentioned to me that Sister Sue Allen had passed away and gone on to be with the Lord. I've known, I've known her for a number of years, um, um, a member of the Lighthouse Church. And as we get ready to go tonight, I want us to just pray for that family because... Um, it doesn't matter if you're old or young. Obviously, when someone's older, you kind of expect it.